Camp is a warm, fuzzy place, and it's a business. And as our friend Jonathan Gold likes to remind us, we have to run a good business first in order to do the good things that we do. Mariel Del Cueto attended and worked at a day camp and now works at a global management consulting firm, Bain and Company. Mario spent his summer, this past summer, on a project that involved visiting some of the great camps across the country. And we're gonna ask him what he learned and what this corporate consulting industry thing can offer the camp industry. This is the Day Camp Pod. Welcome back to the Day Camp Podcast. I'm Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey, and we are joined today by my friend Mario Del Cueto from Bain and Company. How are you doing, yes. Mario? I'm doing well. Good to see you, Andy. So, so Mario, tell us about uh, your little camp journey starting out there in uh, L.A. Yeah, I grew up uh, at Tom Sawyer Day Camp, a day camp just outside Los Angeles in the Pasadena area. Spent some summers at Kelly Island Camp as well, uh, two week summers in a, at a sleepaway. And so I got a little bit of taste of, of both types of camp and uh, really fell in love. And uh, camp uh, has and continues to play a huge role in my life. So Catalina Island Camp, which by the way, all my camp friends out there, you should check out their website because it is really, it is an island off of Los Angeles that has day camp and sleepaway camp, right, Mario? Yep, they're sister camps, Tom Sawyer Camp and Catalina Island Camps, yep. But do, do, do kids go out there for the day at all or is it only sleepaway camp on there? I think it's, uh, at least when I was going back in the mid 2000s, it was just two week sleepaway camp sessions. Got it, take a ferry out to camp. That is Yeah, neat. it was great. So what's Tom Sawyer camp? Like, we're going to have Sarah Hornerfish on here one day because she's pretty cool. But mm -hmm. uh, what's it like? Tom Sawyer camp is a real magical place. It is a camp focused on outdoor learning. Um, there is, it, just like most camps, it's completely uh, plugged out, no technology. You stampede through the wilderness. You make mud balls. You create uh, flags that you hide in your secret fort. And you go on campaigns looking for other people's flags. Um, it's a fantastic day camp. Uh, catering to ages three to 14. There's a really robust junior counselor program uh, for uh, ninth and 10th graders. Some of my favorite memories came as a junior counselor um, and the culture around transition from being a camper to then a junior counselor to then a staff member uh, is a really tight knit community and uh, something that, that really brought me a lot of joy for 17 years. Wow. And I'm guessing, I mean, this is like, there's people that go there from literally downtown LA, right? Like, yeah, from all over. Few, yeah, it's one of the few camps that actually serves like legit LA. So yes, are you true. getting like movie star kids and things there? Yes, uh, movie star kids, as well as kids of Dodger baseball players. Uh, mm -hmm. I had one of those, which was really exciting, especially when the Dodgers had a, a deep playoff run later that year. And I was like, ah, I know your dad. Um, or I, you know, I made a mud ball with your son or whatever you want to say. So yeah, it was pretty fantastic. That's Tom cool. Sawyer Camp uh, also provided transportation. So I was out there driving the 16 passenger van, picking up kids from really? all different parts of Los Angeles, which was a great time. Nice, nice. <laughs> you really went yeah. through the ringer there, the day camp <laughs> ringer. So um, tell us about your, uh, your trip this summer that you took across the country. Yeah, so this summer in June, I graduated uh, from Stanford. I was doing a joint degree there with their business school and their education school. And if I think about what is the combination of, of business and education, that is summer camp. Um, and so I really wanted to look a little bit more critically in, into this space. I pushed my start date, my return date back at Bain out until October um, and then traveled the, the country visiting different sleep camp, uh, sleepaway camps and day camps, working in different capacities, either on their leadership team or as a rank and file uh, counselor to understand kind of two key things. Like one, what is the secret sauce behind camp that makes it so magical? What are the consistent themes across some of America's most successful camps? And then on the other side of that, the, the flip side of that coin, what are some consistent speed bumps or hiccups or issues that camps face? And uh, what are the different approaches that, that different leaders and leadership teams take to, to kind of look at those issues? Um, and so I, I spent a great uh, nine and a half weeks traveling around, uh, working, having fun, and then also learning a lot about the summer camp space. So they threw you into the kitchen, said, do the dishes kind of thing? I hope not. So <laughs> no real kitchens, but I, I was there 6 a.m. leading Gaga Bowl for the early risers at a couple sleepaway camps. Good, good. I like to hear that. So by the way, Mario has a website 
called the camp consultant. How the hell did you get that URL? Did you buy it from Joanna Warren Smith or something? Jesus, that's amazing. I have no idea. I'm uh, I'm counting myself me. lucky, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he he's uh, doing even though he's working full time at Bain, he's he's putting up blog posts uh, of his thoughts and such, uh, you know, derived from the summer and from his his short life. Mario's not an old guy, as you can imagine. So um, so Mario, tell us a little bit about the secret sauce. Yeah. The answer uh, tends to be when you ask people what the secret sauce is behind camp, they say the people, right? But I want to go underneath that and, and understand a little bit more what about the people create such a magical experience for uh, both staff and campers and, and the like. And I think it stems from, from two main things. One, it's the ability to create a space where you can be yourself and then second, be welcomed for that best self, right? Now, hold on. So, You're talking about a staff person, a camper, or all of the above? Or what? All of the above. All of the above. What makes camp special is across all tenure levels, ages, and types of people, camp opens its arms, or let me rephrase, the, the best camps and the camps that really change lives, um, opens their arms to allow for, uh, to, to welcome uh, people who are bringing their best self to camp. Um, and, and then welcoming others into that community of everyone that, that is, you know, kind of marching down that same place, right? And so to talk a little bit more, more tactically, like what types of training do counselors and leadership go, go through to enable, to enable them to create this space? What, uh, what types of characteristics and behaviors and habits do they use when interacting with each other and interacting with children uh, to create this welcoming environment where people do bring their authentic self? So that's a, that's a little bit about the, the magic behind camp. And I can talk about how, how it's kind of created uh, at different places and in different ways. Guys, you can, but just hold on. I got a question first. So you're, For sure. so you're saying that like all these eccentric personalities that come to camp, Okay, mm -hmm. big ones, little ones, introverts, extroverts, annoying people, really awesome people to be with, all that kind of thing. A great camp is a place where all those people can flourish to some degree, right? So it's like yes. an inclusive community, right? Yes. To the biggest degree. Mm -hmm. It's an inclusive community. And I think it's one step beyond that in that you get to choose who you'd like to be in that community. Um, when you come to summer camp, you're not beholden to the same preconceived notions that maybe the other students in your school have or um, at college that your friends put you in X, Y, or Z box. You can reinvent yourself each summer at camp um, and you have the, the liberty to do so. And you're also accepted with whatever best version of yourself that you want to place forward. So I, I, it, it's an awesome combination in that way. Yeah, I always say that it's a great place because uh, kids and staff can go to camp and reinvent themselves because if they're coming, you know, and, you know, they're not coming with their whole class of, of mm -hmm. kids from school, which they've been in the same class with for the last whatever years, you know, they can literally choose a new nickname, they can, you know, they, they could, they can make a new sort of brand for themselves in many ways, you know, like yeah. the kid that's the weird kid that sits in the back can all of a sudden be the really cool kid because of some aspect of his life that everybody really uh, embraces and celebrates. Yeah. And then they, they can take that, that newfound confidence from camp and then bring it back to the rest of their life. Damn, um, yeah. That was that. something that I felt very personally uh, following my seventh grade year, I had experienced some, some bullying um, in middle school, um, was feeling really down on my luck on the friendship front, and then went to camp and was able in my first year of kind of the, the middle school program at Tom Sawyer, find a great group of friends, really reestablish for myself that I could be liked, I could make friends, you know, that I was worth it, um, and then take that confidence back with me to, to school. That's awesome. All right, so let's just touch a little on what you were talking about, about how, how these best camps you were referencing can accomplish you know, can, can at least head towards that goal of, yeah. of, of accomplishing the secret sauce. So I, the, the first thing comes with intentionality, um, especially intentionality in programming. I like to think about camp in terms of, of two concepts, both brick and mortar. When you have your bricks, these are your activity periods. This is when you're in the pool swimming, you're, you're on horseback, you're climbing a wall, Etc. Those are the, the, the building blocks or the bricks within your camp day. And then you also have the mortar, the time uh, or the spaces in between, whether that's when you're moving from one activity to the other, whether that's your, you know, kind of meals or, or assemblies, whether that's the time where your counselor thinks of this like 
really crazy cool new improv game that will take up the, you know, the five minutes before the cooking class begins. Both your brick and your mortar is what contributes to a successful camp. And it, camps that are intentional about, we are gonna prepare our staff to one, be great stewards of the activities, the building blocks, but also be so well prepared and adept and engaged in all the mortar activities. Um, that is how you can really catalyze a great experience uh, for children. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so, so can you give me one of the big stumbling blocks that you saw that, you know, sort of across the board that, that you're seeing camp stumbling from? So if, I, if I'm thinking that it's the, the bricks and the mortar that drive success at camp, um, it is the, on the shoulders of staff that provide great bricks and mortar, especially uh, that mortar. And so if you have either disengaged or uh, ill-prepared staff, that's a very large stumbling block. Um, and I think if I, if I had to point to one word that was a consistent uh, struggle point or at least area of focus across all the camps that I saw, it was staffing. How do we uh, engage, motivate, um, and develop the, the staff, the young adults that we have uh, within our camp organization in order to empower them to provide great outcomes to the kids that they interact with on a daily basis? So Mario, you're familiar with sleepaway camps and day camps now. Yes. So you know that our colleagues at sleepaway camp have the luxury of kidnapping and holding hostage their staff for a solid week before camp begins, if they're lucky. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they're at, during that time, they can, um, you know, they can brainwash them. They can, <laughs> they, can, they can do all the kind of things that you can do to create a culture, create a community, create a feeling of uh, purpose uh, to instill those values and that intentionality. Uh, into things, right? Whereas day camps, we're sort of like the fast food of camping. And we have kids coming in and out, we're going to the drive through we're ordering our fries and our chicken nuggets, and we're out of here kind of thing. Um, extraordinarily tasty, though. Extraordinarily mm -hmm. tasty. And for some, that will be the sleepaway camp of their life, right? Mm -hmm. You know, most kids that go to day camp may never go to sleepaway camp. So, um, so, so, you know, from a day camp operator and from someone like you who's looking at it, you know, from an interesting perspective and who knows, maybe one day you'll, you'll be one of these people. What, what, what do you, what would you do? Okay. Let's catapult yourselves 15 years into the future or something. And, and you're helming a day camp. Um, you know, how would you put forth, how would you frame the training experience so that you could create that kind of feeling that you're talking about to enable that brick and mortar to really hold together? Yeah, it's a really, really good question, especially coming from a training perspective. Mm. Um, so if I was thinking about what are the two most important things that I, I would have in place to, to motivate and engage my counselors, it would be a focus on, on friendship and community building, as well as recognition and development. And standing uh, kind of on top of that from a training perspective is the mindset by which I would want my staff to, to approach the job or help nudge them to approach the job. I think it's a really important consideration that as a camp professional, you are an educator. You are a central cog in the cultivation of the full child, right? Um, it's not just a a uh, daycare type of um, supervision. It's also, you're not trying to create the next Michael Jordan out of this uh, basketball player here. You, as well as the other, you know, extracurriculars that they're involved with, as well as the schools that they attend are a central part in cultivating a well-rounded uh, child. And so with that comes a certain level of responsibility and a certain level of commitment. But the super important dovetail there is you get to fulfill the box of fun education. You get to be the empowering, enjoyable enrichment that the child experiences. And so uh, I, how are the ways that staff can, can show up to, to kind of further promote that? Well, the, the first is through like full engagement and energy and dedication towards uh, whatever game, activity, song initiative it is. And you're only able to, to do that as a counselor if, you're, if your bucket is full. Right, if you're feeling recharged and energized about the the job, and so I, I think a focus on the the two aspects, especially at a day camp, of of friendship and recognition, is what serves camp professionals best. 
So uh, on the friendship point, when I went across the, the country visiting camps, I interviewed over 40 uh, counselors and asked them, what is the largest gift that camp has provided you? Um, and unequivocally, the most uh, frequent response was the friendship. Uh, the lifelong friends that I received from this community. And so as a, you know, either camp director, owner, full-time member of, of, of the leadership team, how are you creating spaces that your counselors can cultivate the, these friendships that they hold so dear, right? Are you giving them appropriate time in training to connect with one another and form friendships? Do you have uh, staff meetings outside of camp hours, you know, beyond, uh, kids being around where staff can actually bond with and connect with one another? Are you intentional in the way that you craft your groups and your co-counselors um, in order to really foster these bonds? Um, so that's that first one on, on friendship. And then the second is, is on recognition. Um, individuals uh, really want to be recognized for the great efforts that they put forth. Um, a, a recent study uh, showed that 52% of people that leave their job mentioned that their manager could have done something to make them stay, right? And so if you are the manager in this, in this sense, can you provide recognition to reduce the churn across your uh, counselor cohort and, and drive greater retention? Um, and this often doesn't need to be monetarily. Uh, as camp people, we know that the power of, of a flag or a sweatshirt or a hat or even a just Hey, John, I recognize that your kids were really excited and engaged when you planned that, that uh, alternative soccer game. How did you come to that idea? Are there ways that we can you know, give non-monetary recognition to really energize our staff? So th those are some of the, the things that come to mind on uh, how to really address that staffing pain point, uh, especially for day camps. The Day Camp Podcast is brought to you by CRS, Commercial Recreation Specialists, fine purveyors of the best recreation solutions to keep your camp going strong. And these guys, my friends at CRS, they got a product that I talked about a lot last season. It's called Concrobium, and it's in their Playtech Recrosol disinfectant, right? So keep your campers healthy and your staff and your, and your staff too, with this easy two-step process for the strongest protection, disinfect your space first with Concrobium and then apply the Playtech Recrosol antimicrobial solution to maintain for 90 days, Mario. Can you believe that? Nine zero. 90 days. This, this, I, it's unbelievable, right? And this stuff is approved for use against SARS, okay? The, vir the virus that causes COVID-19. It's EPA registered. It's category four. It's the lowest toxicity. So you could touch it and then, you know, everything is cool. It's botanically derived, all right? It comes from the spice thyme, T-H-Y-M-E, and it kills 99% of bacteria, viruses, and fungus. You spray it on your playground, and my goodness, it is all good. Long-lasting protection, 90 days. This is stuff that is used in hospitals, right? You can spray it, fog it, or wipe it. Like I said, they use it at hospitals, nursing homes, restaurants, kitchen, and now your camp. So check it out, everybody. Commercial recreation specialist, Concrobium with Playtech Recrosol. It's at crs4rec.com. That is the number four rec.com. CRS is serious about fun. All right, Mario, you're serious about fun too. I appreciate Absolutely. that. And um, all right, so a couple little follow-ups to your thing. So, so I appreciate your perspective of, uh, of how staff you know, get the right mindset about what they're doing and all. The, the number one uh, bit of feedback that we got from our staff this summer was their, um, their, their struggle with managing kids' behaviors. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I feel like that year or two that we sort of lost, you know, that our staff, our younger staff, our high school and college kids in particular, I'm talking about here, they sort of lost some something i don't know they lost skills they lost uh patience they lost ability to deal with frustrations they lost a lot of stuff that is sort of integral to the <laughs> working at day camp experience yeah. right so mm -hmm. um so one thing that we're going to be putting in big time this year into our training is a lot more like camp counselor 101 stuff and not taking that for granted um, because mm -hmm. you're right, we could we could have all the greatest philosophies and thoughts about what we want to do at our camp, um, but if our if our staff can't execute it, then we got problems, and and that's what I'm finding. I'm talking to other day camp um, people too who are telling me similar that the sort of basics of being a camp director 
are missing. The, the heart is there. The desire is there, right? The positivity, right? The, hey, guys, this is going to be a great thing. That is there. But the, holy crap, this kid is just not listening to me. I have no concept what to do thing. Like that is, is what we need to teach these young people. Mm -hmm. I, that definitely resonates with me. I'd say a consistent theme that I saw across camps was, was threefold. Kids are less emotionally developed. Uh, staff tend to be more or less resilient, a little bit more fragile, and parents are more demanding. Um, do, do you think those three things showed up at your camp, Andy? Yeah, I mean, I think my, my, I think I, I'm in an area where the parents are pretty cool and they're pretty understanding. Um, so I don't think the demanding thing has changed, but I do know that my friends in the more affluent areas, that's absolutely what they're hearing because those folks are just like that. Um, yeah. Um, but I tend to think they were like that before too. I think, I think mm -hmm. we just, the problem is if we went through two years of them just being happy that we were open you know? mm -hmm. and now yeah. things are sort of shifting back to, I, I don't know, I think relative normal in some regards. Um, yeah. All right. I, I wanted to shift uh, to the, to the next thing, which okay. is um, you wrote a blog, which, um, you know, it touches on a bunch of things and hopefully we can dive into a little more here about what, can what can camps learn from the consulting world because we run these businesses and you know i am sort of a very typical camp director right i'm a musician that became a school teacher and now i'm a camp director right and i'm sort of yep. take i've taken my lumps over the last couple of decades and i've learned how to do a lot of stuff i have some friends that are lawyers i have some friends that were you know like anything right um there's really not, you know, most camp directors get into this job relatively unprepared. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as their skill set goes. So from the stuff that you learn that gets you to a place like Bain, um, and the stuff that Bain does when they plunk people like you at these companies and say, hey, help fix them, right? What are some of the things that you can advise uh camps? Yeah. So I, I want to really quickly go back to something you said there about coming in unprepared. I, I'll push back on that because you have a lot of experience in the day camp uh, world and that prepares you a lot more than, you know, a finance class or, or working in management consulting will. Oh, I do Even now. If a lot but when I started working at full time at a camp at 27, I absolutely did not. It took me a decade to learn these things. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And I guess the experience on the job within camp is what's going to be the most, you know, impactful. Um, but that's not to belittle some of the best practices that corporate America can teach camps. Um, I, I have a, a long list in, in my mind of kind of what these best practices are and, and how they can be extrapolated to camps. But I think the three that, that bubble up to, to the forefront for me are uh, feedback what systems and mechanisms do you have to implement feedback at your at your camp? Uh, that's one. Number no, no, two. Let's let's talk. No, don't let's get just start with yet. one. Let's, okay. let's talk let's about feedback. One. Great. Okay, because because we all suck at feedback. Okay, at camps. All right. And, and by the way, if I'm insulting my day camp pod mm -hmm. listeners, if you're actually good at it, well then God bless you because you are the one percent. All okay. right. Because generally speaking, we Mario in camping mm -hmm. like you are a nice person, okay? And nice people don't like saying things to other nice people to critique them because yeah. we're so afraid of their feelings. It's so mm -hmm. annoying. We have this problem. It's like our Achilles heel is that we're nice. So, all right, Mario, I'm filibustering you, go ahead. Well, I, <laughs> what you mentioned there is kind of like a reluctance or, or a hesitance to deliver consistent yeah. feedback. That, not, I'll, and, I'll go a step further, say it's a selfishness. To selfishness, yeah. Um, and what that selfishness does is really deprives uh, both staff, well, mostly staff, from learning the 21st century skill of giving and receiving feedback. I think camps are so uniquely positioned to teach this skill to our young adults in a way that the U.S. education system really doesn't have them well prepared, right? Like if you think about how often can a high school student provide critical feedback or constructive criticism to a teacher or an athletic coach. Like it, it just doesn't really happen. Preach, what's more, preach, Mario. You're yeah, it, so right. It, what's more that it happens is that these adults give feedback in a way that is either disempowering, disempowering or disengaging uh, to these young adults and, and can, you know, have harmful effects. And so how do you change that at your camp? How can you create a community that is committed to continuous improvement and, and healthy feedback uh, at camp? 
I think there's a really important heuristic that I learned in the business world that camps, a lot of camps do adopt, but everyone should. And that is SMART feedback. SMART feedback is a, um, an acronym for feedback that is specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time bound. By incorporating the aspects of SMART feedback into your feedback sessions, you can really empower and connect and develop your young adults. And I would challenge camps to take this one step further, not only in delivering smart feedback, but giving their counselors the opportunity to practice giving smart feedback to one another. Can you set up Ooh, systems where senior, yeah, it's important because the 21st century skill is not just receiving feedback, it's also giving feedback, mm -hmm. right? And, and there's two ways that camps can and really should be doing this. The first is, can senior counselors review uh, more junior counselors in a formalized evaluation setting? Can they do this with counselors in training? Perhaps there could be formalized peer review sessions where counselors spend the time thinking ahead of time, writing down these specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time-bound concepts um, and delivering that feedback to someone else, right? So creating some formality around that process is number one. And number two, equally, if not even more important, is bringing in the concept of upward feedback to your camp. Upward feedback is the process by which the more junior person in a feedback discussion gives feedback to the person above them about what actions that more senior member can take to improve the work experience. Okay, for hold example, on to that. One, one yeah. second on that. The issue that I have with upward feedback, I mean, I love it and we try it and we ask for it and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The issue is that 80% of the people are not willing to really give it because they're so self-conscious that it will, it will negatively impact them somehow. And they don't want to step on anybody's toes and they pass it aggressively. Do not give it to us in a formal way. They would rather give it to them, give it to their friends informally. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, anyway, that's just- so, th so there's some ways that you can combat that, right? Like you can, during your training, give some examples of, constructive upward feedback. And then in a more one-on-one -on -one individualized uh, setting, when your senior counselors are conducting the feedback session with the junior, junior, more junior member, they can give examples of upward feedback that they have said to other people um, and delivered before. And then also other examples of upward feedback that they have received that have landed well on them, right? When I received upward feedback from a more junior colleague, that said, hey, Mario, when you ask me what, how long it'll take to finish this analysis, um, I feel more uh, triggered than supported. I realized, oh, wow, I was asking this question so that I could load balance our work uh, and you know, both get us out of here earlier. But instead, it felt like I was applying an arbitrary deadline. Without her giving me that upward feedback, I wouldn't have been able to, to know the effect that I had on her. Right. And that's and like an example I would give. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, and that's a great example, because I think that a lot of our, our younger people are a little bit socially unaware when it comes to those kind of things, you mm -hmm. know, and, and they need that. They need that, you know, and going back to what I said about it being selfish, it's selfish because you touched on it, Mario, because it's, we're missing opportunities to help these people grow. Yes. You know? So we're, we're putting our discomfort ahead of the, the, the whole reason we're here, which is human mm -hmm. development, you know? And if they're not going to be able to practice giving feedback at camp, where are they going to be able to practice, right? This can and should be that special haven for healthy feedback. Um, and, and it takes a large operational lift on behalf of camp directors and camp professionals to change your programming around to allow the time for these counselors to be alone and have that uh, conversation, right? Maybe you need to have a generalist SWAT team or a floater program that will go with that group to allow these people the 20, 30 minutes to have that evaluation. There, there's yes. programmatic uh, implications, but so, I think yeah, it's I, a burden see, camp I can should wear. Went, I can see you went to Camp Champions. You had the SWAT team there because uh, mm -hmm. my son made us adopt that moniker for our, for our floaters. Oh, yeah. Um, we, we supplanted the Michael Brandwine supers with, with SWAT now. It just, it, it works a lot better. Um, yeah, I mean, the, it is a huge operational lift. And, and we say it all the time on this podcast, Mario. We talk about things that are really important. And we say, and if you want to actually make it work at your camp, you have to prioritize it the same way you prioritize the other things that you think are really important in your camp. And when it comes to this kind of feedback thing, 
Um, it's one of those things, sort of like your SMART acronym. There's something else out there that sort of describes what I'm about to say. But you can't expect anything to actually happen until you check up, unless you check up on it, yes. right? You can't just go decree, hey, middle management person, you need to check in with every one of your people for five or 10 minutes every single week, and you need to do this little thing and that. And they nod their heads and say, you got it, boss, no problem, and then expect that it happens. There has to be somebody that's checking on it on a weekly basis to actually ensure that it's happening, and also mentoring them to make sure that they're doing properly, that they're mm-hmm. not con- coming off as condescending, that they're coming off as respectful during it and all that kind of thing too, and talking yeah. to all the parties involved. Like you said, it's a huge operational lift because you're so worried about getting the kids to swim on time. Okay. And what happens when it rains? Okay. Mm-hmm. And the buses were late and all that kind of crap that you forget about this, but this is part of the mortar that you were talking about. Yes. This is what makes it happen. All that fluffy philosophical crap that we talk about, it will mm-hmm. not take effect unless all this stuff can happen. And this is a fast track to success, but very few people will do it. Because mm-hmm. it just, it takes really good middle management staff. It takes a, a, a serious commitment, right? And the people at the top have to be committed to it too, right? Absolutely. Because if it just gets decreed and then you sort of leave it to be, you know, like I said, it won't happen. Yeah. So you need to be able to, you know, kind of check back on it, hear from staff, like what is going well and what could be improved on your kind of feedback structures. And then importantly, to your point about like with the hecticness of getting the kids to the pool and getting them to horses on time and all of these things, how can you offset the hecticness by implementing structures to lean upon, right? Routines and structures that camp knows so well, um, how can those be applied to whatever change that you're trying to exist in your camp? Um, so that, that becomes part of the operational lift. Are you going to check in with these middle managers at, uh, at the Monday meeting, right? Is a part of your end of day, you know, sign out ticket being, yes, I did conduct my one-on-one, uh, what, whatever, whatever structure is going to be like useful at your camp needs to be adopted. It's not something that gets said once at training. And then at the end, you're like, all right, so how did feedback go this summer? That doesn't, doesn't cut it. Yeah. No, that happened at my camp this summer where we have a really, pretty rigorous uh, system and a couple of my unit leaders like completely didn't do it. You know, they, they had, they were, they were prioritizing other things and they're doing it. We really didn't know until last week of camp. And I honestly wasn't pissed at them. I was pissed at me and my people Mm -hmm. for not picking up on it and staying on top of it, you know, because if they were reminded on a regular basis, they would have done it. I'm sure they weren't mm-hmm. bad employees, you know, um, yeah. but we do have a, a system in effect, the E21 system, which, um, you know, some of the camps out there are starting to use now. Um, uh, tell me a little bit more about that one. E21. Uh, yeah. It's something that uh, Scott Brody and, and friends came up with, with a little help from me and Steve Baskin and, and, okay. folks. and it's a, it's a check-in system with, uh, with your staff that we are uh, now going out and offering to other camps. Uh, and, and one of the things uh, that that's part of it is a weekly check-in with your people that must happen um, and a reverse and upward uh, check-in kind of thing too uh, that I, I do every two weeks I think every week in a day camp setting is a little much but we do it every two weeks and one of the first que- it's very short and sweet and one of the questions in there is are you getting the kind of support that you're looking for from your mm-hmm. so are you getting checked in with every single week like that kind of thing so that it can help us know if it's effective, because, you know, I mean, my, my camp has over 250 staff. It's hard for us to, for, to, to know what's going on. We sort yeah. of do have to send out these kind of surveys and aggregate things uh, to a degree. And I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that this data is collected digitally and placed into mm-hmm. a you know central place that can be referred to later. Yep. Yeah. I, that hits on maybe the second thing that I think that camps can learn the most from the business world. And that's capture data to capture value, right? In this, uh, this feedback system that you're articulating there, you're able to go back and see, hey, this counselor needs more support here. Or maybe last summer, this counselor, you can go back even further in records, struggled with X, Y, and Z. Let me follow up and see how they're doing. And now maybe they can be a success story to talk to my other counselors about an improvement area. You don't know that if it's written on a piece of paper and you know filed away in your, in your cabinet and never referred to again. And so I think camps have a lot of value left on the table by not digitally capturing uh, the data across all of their different processes, whether that be interviewing, whether that be feedback, whether that be reference checks, what have you. Yeah. Um, 
Well, hopefully yeah, huge. when this next generation of uh, folks in their 20s and 30s, you know, start taking over these camps, that that can be implemented a lot more because I can tell you mm-hmm. that the people in their 40s and 50s and 60s, there's a whole lot of post-it notes going on. Yeah. A whole lot of scribble pads going on. And it's, it makes it really, really tough to, uh, to put things into, into data format so that you yeah. can look at things big picture and assess. And again, if you're running a camp with, you know, 50 kids and uh, and 30 staff or whatever, like, like that's one thing. But if you have a big place, you need to see the big trends. Yes. And you need to be able to look at, you know, trends year over year. And then also you need to be able to formalize and crystallize all this institutional knowledge, right? To continue the positive legacy of your camp, uh, it needs to be able to be referred to by the new leaders and the, and the new energetic blood that comes in that contributes to this positive culture. Right. So the more that you have on the shelf, that's a phrase we use in consulting, something that is referenceable, that is digitally creative, kind of one of those, if it's not written down, it doesn't exist type of type of things. Mm -hmm. How can at your camp, you create more materials on the shelf that will propel growth in future years? So important. All right. Um, I'm going to take a quick break and talk about our friends at Camp Tivities. You know, they're from out where you're from. Oh, yes. I I know the the owner and founder quite well. Great guy. Canaret, as they say. Um, Mm -hmm. That I always miss miss say. But anyway, camptivities.com. Check them out, folks. If scheduling was a headache for you last summer, you should check out Camp Tivities. It's designed for camps by camps, which is what Mario and I are saying. Right? Save time, money, and resources and create the best diverse activity schedule that you can find, right? We know it's hard and that's why they've got, you know, uh, auto scheduling, camper and group scheduling, rainy day scheduling, which is neat, manual adjustments, tons of customizable settings and much more. If you're looking for a better way to schedule this summer, go to camptivities.com. They'd love to show you the next big thing in camp programming, okay? Camptivities.com. All right, so Mario, I've got a question. We'll, we'll get to Absolutely. the third one in a second, but I've got a question. Okay, um, yep. So let's say that I'm some, you know, Fortune 500 company, right? With, uh, you know, tons of money to, to blow on Bing Company, right? And I yes. call you guys in and you guys, you know, you send your little SWAT team of Mario's. That's what we call it too. We call right. it a SWAT team as well. All right. So um, <laughs> what do you guys do when you attack this company? Like, like to assess and create this, this stuff on the shelf that you referenced and things like that. Like, how do you guys assess where a company is at? And what, you know, where, where their weaknesses are and where, where, where you need to help uh, strengthen them. Yeah. I think the most important thing is getting to the right questions, right? So talking with senior leadership about where they believe the uh, greatest value accruing actions are, right? Where are the largest points for improvement? How have you gone about trying to achieve that before? Um, what has worked, what hasn't worked, where do you see things in five years? If we were to paint the beach of what success looks like, well, um, you know, kind of what is that image? So asking these right questions that will then identify, you know, places to dig deeper. And the, the core element of the Bain Consulting Kit that we apply here is answer first thinking. What that means is we put a stake in the ground on a key question. Say the key question is, should we launch X product in Y market. We'll put a stake in the ground and say, no, you should not launch this market in this market in this market because customer preferences is for a higher priced item or something like that. Right. And then we go through all this work through data collection, through expert interviews, through uh, industry analysis, through other forms of, of collection to either validate or disprove this hypothesis. Um, and, and that is kind of how uh, we provide value to the clients. And I think the same thing can happen at camp, right? Uh, you have a pressing problem such as uh, attrition for my counselors this summer was higher than it's ever been, right? Mm-hmm. I urge people to establish a hypothesis, put a stake in the ground. It was so high because they felt burnt out, burnt out and the counselor's experience was unsustainable. And then go about collecting data to either prove or disprove this hypothesis. You know, you can look back at your expert interview notes. You can talk to um, some of both of your most contented and your least contented counselors and either prove or disprove that hypothesis. Um, so yeah, this answer first thinking isn't uh, relegated to just the management consulting realm. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and look, the reasons that these Fortune 500 companies go mm-hmm. out and hire a company like Bain is because they don't have the bandwidth 
and they don't have the know-how to do it. Mm -hmm. And they recognize that. Now, fortunately, they have the budgets to do it, mm -hmm. right? But again, they're prioritizing it, right? You yeah. can go into a company that's losing money at this point, and they're trying to turn it around, right? And yeah. they, they are prioritizing that they need to figure out why this is happening in order to keep their business, you know, to turn their business around. Um, a camp... Okay. You know, full time staff at camp is generally very small. It's like a skeleton team. Yes. And they, they may all be wondering what is the deal with their camp attrition, but they don't have in their mind, it's not a priority enough for them to get on the phone to offer a, a staff person that quit mid season 50 bucks to have a conversation with them or something like that yeah. right, to figure out how to actually get this data because it's going to take a long time. They're more worried about, well, oh my God, we have to interview 10 more new people. And then the next thing you know, it's the same thing going on this summer that happened last summer. It was yeah. a perpetual thing. Yeah. Hey, your, your point about priorities is extraordinarily on point. And as it relates to kind of my work, I love working as a consultant because I come in and work on what is the highest priority for the client, right? They're paying us all this money for what they think is the most important, but sometimes we're not working on the most important thing. And it's a tough job as a consultant. It's a hard conversation, but it's a conversation that we, uh, we often have to have is you want us to look at launching this product here, but the real issue is your costs in your outsourced systems are too high. We should be thinking and talking about that. Um, and so helping companies prioritize is, is a major focus of management consulting and, and a skill set that, as you were mentioning, extrapolates directly to camp. How yeah. can you make sure that your, you know, two or three must do's are actually getting done? Yeah. And like you said, looking, looking at the right issue is, is, is something that can happen. I think the lesson that we camp people learned uh, in the last couple of years, when we came out of the pandemic and, mm -hmm. and we're preparing for summer 2021, we were all worried about children's mental health and oh my god these kids are going to be climbing the walls it's going to be like they're going to be like escape prisoners you know being plunked into our camps and the next thing we know we were all looking at the wrong thing and yeah. it was the staff it was yeah. our young staff that were the ones with the issues and the kids were relatively fine it was mm -hmm. just the staff couldn't yeah. deal with it oh so true yeah um, andy you're, you're probably hitting on my largest personal learning from this summer and that's how much of a focus of a camp director is on the staff and not the kids that was one of the largest surprises for me um for exactly some of the reasons you just said well from the old guy over here mario it did used to be that way when when camp directors used to hang out with each other we used to just talk about crazy parents and crazy kids and things like that and now 90 percent of it is crazy staff it's literally just flip-flop. The pendulum has gone to the other way. All right. So before we leave, Mar, what was the third big thing that was in that blog about? The third uh, one is what is your golden metric? A golden metric is a non-revenue figure that indicates the health of a business. It's the connection between a customer's problem and the company's offering. For example, uh, at DoorDash, that golden metric is meals delivered. At WhatsApp, that's messages received. If you can institute a golden metric at your camp, it allows employees increased focus on what you're driving towards and a measurable scorecard along that. Where your camp is in kind of the maturity cycles will change what that golden metric should be for you, um, whether it's maybe new signups per month or staff retention or uh, uh, customer feedback, you know, NPS following the summer. That's going to change by camp, but identifying for you and your small leadership team, as you mentioned, what is the one thing that we're all driving for that is directly correlated with the success of our business? That's your golden metric, and that should be your largest focus. Yeah, so at Liberty Lake, we're doing amazingly at getting campers to sign up and return because mm -hmm. there's just a need for camp right now. Um, we would love to have staff feel the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. and have that same ability to do it. Uh, but we're going up against all these societal trends and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so that's a good challenge out there to, to, to find a golden metric that is relevant for your camp. Yeah, sneak so peek on what my next blog post will be. For mature camps, I think that employee retention is the golden metric you should be tracking. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about the value of employee retention and how it can be kind of driven um, at another time. Yeah. Well, look, Mario, get a, get a few more months in at Bain. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, talk to, we'll talk to you after the holidays. We'll bring in a, uh, another camp director person. Um, but look, I really, really appreciate you you coming on with us and sharing your thoughts. This was this was terrific. It really was. Uh, so thank you. 
uh, to Mario. You can check out his, what, go ahead and sell yourself a little bit there, Mario. Tell him about your blog. Yeah, I've, I've got a blog at uh, thecampconsultant.com. I, I post twice a month on my musings on the intersection between business and camps. Uh, I'm additionally going on a little bit of a presentation tour. I just wrapped up presenting at the Western Association of Independent Camps Conference, and I will be presenting as well at uh, ACA National as well as ACA Tri-State, um, and really look forward to connecting with some of you listeners there, um, as well as on my blog. All right, thanks, Mario. We want to thank the Go Camp Pro Team, Camp Activities, and Commercial Recreation Specialists for allowing us to bring this podcast for you. And if you like what you hear, you should subscribe to the Day Camp Pod on your favorite podcast platform. Check out our show notes from all our episodes at daycamppodcast.com, as well as contact information for the show, for Mario, for me. And thanks for listening. Make yourself a better Day Camp Pro. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode of the Day Camp Pod.